A long way to drive for just a church service. Yeah, I sure yeah, appreciate yeah. it. We have people drive from Orlando and Gainesville and all that, but you, you, you win the prize today. <laughs> what is the prize? Well, you've received it. You're, you're here. <laughs> so we're glad to have you. Good to have Brother Roy with us and his family here. Amen. And had the celebration service for his wife's home going yesterday and Amen. appreciate the privilege of being able to do that. Brother Roy, it's good to have you all with us here this morning. All right, now just to kind of give you a quick update on a couple of things, especially for those that are visiting with you. We're talking about uh, 1 Timothy 4, if you want to text here this morning. Now, I have already been questioned about this, and, and I'll, just, I'll just let you know. Uh, they've asked me why I don't have a screen up here and a pointer or a, a PowerPoint type of a presentation. Well, because I'm old school. And because I'm afraid of that stuff. Now, I, I realize the modern world is moving in that direction and the modern uh, professors are using it and teachers in school and all your teachers, they have an iPad in front of you so that they can click a button and then it comes up as a presentation. Y'all have to help me because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of that stuff getting a foothold. I feel the same way I do about that that I do about music. That, that, that trendy, contemporary um, that, that sort of syncopated beat that kind of gets you to, you know, moving like you'd move at the club on Saturday. It don't fit, it, excuse me, it doesn't fit for me on Sunday. Right. Right. It's your own personal way of doing things if you want to. But a lot of the stuff that I do is to try to insulate me uh, because I'm afraid of that stuff. My dad warned me years ago. Now, my dad died when he was my age now. But my dad warned me years ago. He said... The one thing about music, he said, actually, there's two things. He said, number one, uh, once you let the wrong music in, it's nearly impossible to get it out. Amen. He said, so you always want to be careful any kind of music that you let in. He said, number two, one of the things you'll decide beside the nursery that will cause you more problems in the ministry than anything else will be music. He said, it'll be something connected with the choir. It'll be something, because now back then they had the big robed choir and had all the, you know, you hired in the old Southern Baptist churches, you had a full-time minister of music. Yeah. And what he did during the week, I got no idea. But, you know, on Sunday they had choir practice, and on Wednesday night they had choir practice instead of church. They'd all go back for choir practice, see, you know, so you were special if you, they had auditions for who could sing in the choir and all that other. And then he'd work all, all year on a Christmas cantata and an Easter cantata. And that didn't matter if you had 40 people in the church or 4,000. That was a, considered a necessary thing. You also had a minister of education. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, a minister of education was a paid position to have somebody that's supposed to be there to tell your Sunday school teachers how to teach a curriculum. Here's the curriculum. You have any questions? Okay, good. Have a good day. Go teach. Right. right? But somehow or another, how to punch up the class or how to paint the wall different to make people really want to come. You know what I've learned about people? I know the number one reason why people don't come to church. I know it for a fact. They don't want to. <laughs> I mean, they can veil it any way they want to veil it. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm sick and tired. I'm this. I'm that. I got a problem. No, the, here's the bottom line. They don't come because they don't want to come. There's nothing that you can do to enhance anything for them. Listen, whenever you want to try to have a church, here's the thing you got to understand about church. Church is for the part, the, 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 in, most important thing is the purpose of church is, is to teach you the Bible to draw you closer to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It is not for a bunch of programs. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Because what happens is you start worrying about filling slots, filling ministries, filling all these things up. No, just come and get the preaching. Right. You say, why? Well, you get the preaching right, then you might get the kinks knocked out of your head right. if you apply it. No offense intended to our visitors. You have none whatsoever. That may any assumptions there. Now, when it comes to this thing about uh, discerning some things as far as your conscience, God gave you a conscience, believe it or not. And before you even got saved, that conscience is active. After you get saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in the same place as the conscience, and the Holy Spirit will tell that conscience, tell them it's not right, and tell them it's wrong, and tell them this, and tell them that. But you can defile, which we'll get to in a little while. You can sear, you can dirty up, you can, uh, you can make your conscience be an evil conscience. You live in a world right now 
where the man's conscience is turned upside down. I mean, it literally, what, what used to be wrong just a couple of years ago is now, well, you know, I was not too long ago, I was down in a place down in the middle of the state. I won't give you any of the details. You can fill in the blanks if you want to and whisper to your neighbor. I think I know where he's talking about. Uh, but, but I was in the middle of the state and was having a conversation with somebody and I, I mentioned some things and he asked, I didn't bring up, he asked. He said, so if you were to describe your church, what would you, how would you describe it? I'd say, oh, you know, probably old school. We're probably traditional. He goes, what do you mean by that? I said, well, we have traditional music. We sing out of a hymn book. And we don't have drums and we don't have guitars and we don't have, you know, dancing and smoking mirrors and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I said, you know, and, and he said, oh, he said, kind of like, like I've heard the old timers used to be. And I said, go well, maybe kind of like that. I said, we still believe in some standards. We believe that people ought to live right and do right and act right, you know. And I kind of was trying to be funny. I said, you know, spit white. He said, what does that mean? I said, we don't chew chew in tobacco, that kind of thing. <laughs> And he didn't laugh. He was real kind of serious. I didn't know if he like had a roll of skull in his back pocket or something. I, you know, a guy told me one time, he said, no, I don't, I don't dip. I don't dip. And I said, what's that ring on your back pocket? You know, where the jeans had wore out in that one spot. I said, what's that ring? He goes, oh, uh, uh, no, there's no answer for that. that. You know exactly what the size of that thing is. I don't care if you dip or don't dip. You know, that kind of stuff. Can I dip and go to heaven? Yeah, I've just got to go to hell to spit. So... <laughs> I mean, we wouldn't want you to spit on golden streets, man. Come on. Come on. Why would you want to do that? You know? <laughs> Not going to be any spittoons up there. You know, and have somebody drink the thing, can't put it down because it's all in one strand. You can't have all that stuff going on. <laughs> that stuff's so filthy, you can't get a fly to land on it. <laughs> you ever seen some stuff a fly will land on? Anyway, anyway. So I, so I was talking to him about it. Now, this is going to, this is going to, I'm going to say right, right off, it's probably going to offend some of you now, but, but I'm going to say what I said to him. He said, well, uh, well, and, and, and what other ways? I said, well, you know, clean living. I said, trying to live right, stay in fellowship with Jesus Christ. I said, we, we don't believe in shacking up. Amen. I don't even know why I said that. The guy's, you know, upper to seventies. So we don't believe in shacking up. And I immediately saw that, that, involuntary response and I was like oh boy I done stepped in something there I'm thinking you know I don't know what you know and he said well what's the problem with that you know I mean after you get old I mean who says you got to give and here we go man we'll come to find out he happens to be a part of a place where a lot of people get together and they spend uh, all their time together and they're no more married they're just jumping from bed to bed and person to person and it's an old folks home. I guess when you get old that it don't apply to you. Is that what that is? Is that how it is? It's okay to shack up now because I guess that's all right now. See, I told you to offend some of you. <laughs> and it ain't right for you being young either. And that's not a sermon for the young people. That's a sermon for old people. You say, why? I don't know. You're trying to really relive your younger days or something? Look in the mirror, man. All that stuff hanging off of you. <laughs> That's not a wetsuit that you... Anyway. So, so how... So, <laughs> so how is it that I measure... Let me get back on task. How is it I measure whether or not I keep my conscience clear... The Apostle Paul said to have a clear conscience toward God and toward man. How do I know my conscience is right? Step number one, don't trust yourself. Amen. I know that's a hard thing to say. Don't trust how you think. You say, why? With all due respect, and I mean it in the kindest fashion, everybody in here has the propensity to get whacked out at some point in time. Amen. You, I'm on the phone real late last night to an individual that's got some real serious stuff and she'd already gone up and gone to bed and I'm on the phone and, and the whole thing is, is I have to keep pointing him right here. I know how you feel. I know what you're thinking. I understand the problem that you have, but this is what the book says. Why? Because in times of tragedy, when people act out of character, they're under pressure. You have to recognize if they don't anchor themselves in truth, you can't go by their version of truth. 
Modern theology teaches that truth is something that is ever shifting. There's nothing permanent about that truth and therefore there is no foundation and therefore insecurity and fear is bred because there's nothing solid. This right here gives you what's solid. So in order for me to find out if my conscience is clear toward God, He gave me a measuring stick. They say, well, preacher, you know, I was always taught when I, I just came from Carolina. I just, I just always, Drina Lynn says, you're slipping again. I, I was just always taught, you know, uh, let your conscience be your God. Well, that can be a dangerous thing if your conscience is not being controlled by the Lord. Amen. Ted Bundy didn't have a conscience didn't bother him at all neither did John Wayne Gacy in Texas his mama didn't either she could smell the stench of dead bodies being buried under the floorboard of his house and knew he was doing things he shouldn't be doing but she just appreciated that she had a place to stay so much that she never opened her cotton picking mouth to the tune of multiple bodies being found under there. And then when they interview the guy, he's just as deadpan as you can imagine. You know, well, I did this and I did that. And then I cut him up and I done so on and so forth. And, and this and that. And I rolled him up and put him in plastic and put him under the... And then went and found me another one. I don't recommend you study that stuff. I don't recommend you look into that stuff. I don't recommend you spend any time with that stuff. You say, what does it do? It has a tendency to run the edge off your conscience. Yeah, right. You shouldn't be bothered by the fact that the sight of blood makes you a little queasy. I'm not talking about if you're a nurse or a doctor or whatever. You should be bothered by that. Amen. You should be bothered when you hear certain stories. Certain things could make the butterflies. Now, there's people that are trained that are, they learn how to overcome the body's natural response. But whether you like it or not, the Bible says what goes in your eye affects your heart. That's your thought process. Amen. And you keep having a diet of all this murder stuff and killing stuff and video games and all that stuff where it begins to knock the edge off and you just don't even see people as humans anymore than you have some of the things you've had of recent. You say, oh, surely you don't think that's the reason why. Well, I can tell you this. I can guarantee you it contributed to it. I didn't say it caused it, but it certainly fed it. You know what I know? I know anything you don't feed dies. You don't look at me like I'm crazy. Some of you are like, what? If you have a dog, if you don't feed that dog, you know what's going to happen? All the dog lovers in your neighborhood are going to call you in for, because they think the dog's a human. And so they're going to call you in for mistreating the dog for not feeding him. Am I right? You have, I don't care if it's fish. If you don't feed the fish, you go out there one day and say, how come that fish eating him? Because he's floating upside down in the pond or in the aquarium. Why? I wonder why he's all blowed up there like that. Because you haven't fed him. You know what I know about your spirit? I know if you don't spirit, uh, feed it, it dies off. You don't lose your salvation, but you lose your sensitivity to the things of God. You know what I know about the human spirit, the spirit of man, Second Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. I know that if you keep feeding it worldly food, I know it gets stronger. It never dies off. You know why some of you have a difficult time when it comes to church? Because you've been feeding the wrong one all week long. And the other one is your soul is starved to death. Now, what do I have to do? I have to be willing to admit, first of all, I can't trust myself. I know that's a hard for all of us because we all think we're right. No reason with you. Just completely blinded to the fact that maybe you're wrong. This is what you got to go by. What's the Bible say? You know, a hard thing for you, ma'am, if the Bible agrees with your husband and you're wrong, you know what you'll tend to do? You'll tend to get emotional. And you'll turn it into something emotional instead of truth. You thinking about getting married? You better listen to an old man. You know what will happen with you, sir? Whether you like it or not, that woman ain't wrong all the time. And if the Bible's on her side, you're wrong. I'm wore out with this idea that all women are stupid. I have a list of all the things that women have accomplished, but one of the greatest accomplishments they ever did was putting up with the likes of me and you as men. Having to live in a world the way you live in it. 
I'm not trying to venerate or exalt the woman above the man and all that. Listen here, you bitter old man, you. You, the reason your marriage came apart is because you just constantly just shoving them down all the time and trying to reign and rule like you're the boss. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says where the righteous rule, the people rejoice. And my wife's always uh, uh, complaining and griping and moaning and all that other kind of stuff all the time like that. Well, you might look at the ruler in the mirror. Amen. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe she's not all the problem. I know a preacher right now. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know a preacher right now that it doesn't matter what happens. Somebody comes to him with a marital problem, he's already jaded. He's already made up his mind. It's got to be the woman's fault. He made a mistake of asking me one time over a plate of fish. We're sitting there eating, and I'm kind of picking the stuff off the bones there. I don't know what kind of white fish or something. And we're sitting there. Come on in. Have a seat. Make yourself a spot. Find yourself a hole. And then picking along there and stuff like that. And he said, uh, do you do much uh, marital counseling? And I said, as little as possible. He said, why is that? I said, it's a no-win situation. I said, no matter what, what you're going to always have one, one half of it upset with you. And most likely the man don't want to be there in the first place. I said, that's just how men are. But I said, I do some of it on occasion. He said, do you find that most of the time that the woman's at fault? I said, no. He, he like lost his appetite. He's like... I said, no. I said, I don't know anything until they sit down. I said, there's his truth, there's her truth, and then the real truth is in the middle. <laughs> I said, I, I've got to be honest with you. I couldn't tell you that it's any better than 50-50. I said, the truth of the matter is, is that when I sit down with them, what they're wanting to tell me the problem is, is never the problem. That's the veneer it hides behind. Behind that is they're using this one thing because they're bitter about something that happened. I said, for a woman, it'll be 25 years ago. For a man, it'll be 25 minutes ago. <laughs> I said, the woman won't turn it loose. But I said, the man, you know, he goes to bed and wakes up the next day and thinks, oh, well, the sun came up. Everything's good. We're all golden. Everything's good. <laughs> yeah, we're wonderful. And she's like, you remember what you said to me? And he, he said, well, I, I said this. She goes, no, I was talking about when we was down, you know, it, honey, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> For hers yesterday. Yeah. Good preaching. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about getting married. Good. Keep thinking about it. <laughs> Keep thinking about it. Can I get a witness? Amen. How do I find out if I'm thinking right? There's only one way I know. It is not by the newspaper, newspaper or the news media. If you let the news media do your thinking for you, I don't care if you've caught and pick and thinks it's fair and balanced and all, that's you deciding who you think is telling the truth. Most of you, rarely ever, I got a couple of friends that are, they're real researchers. They send me stuff every now and then, but I can assure you, that thing looks like a, 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 uh, a paper or a thesis with footnotes and everything else where they verified information. Most of you get information, you think because a talking head brings it out over the radio or over the television, you think, oh, well, it must be the truth, you know. <laughs> no, it's their version of the truth. I just read a big headline the other day of somebody talking about a shooting that took place. And the way that the article is written is to make you think it just occurred. It happened three years ago. But you don't know that till you get to the third paragraph. They made it look like it just occurred because what they're trying to do is tee off on what just happened in these other two things. And they're trying to say, this is an epidemic and this is going on and this is what's happening. And then you read the article and I'm thinking, man, I don't remember that thing happening. I, I don't remember. So I, I read the article and I got down in about the third paragraph. I'm reading something and it was 2016. You jack leg, you man. You're just filling space in a newspaper. Now, what do I need to do? I need to recognize that all those influences are in there and that if I don't have the truth to balance it all out, then I'm headed for trouble. Amen. So I gave you these things here and it's important. I apologize for the recap, but I can't emphasize this enough. This is part of what church is about. It's to balance out all the foolishness you get all week long to get a good dose of truth when you're here. Amen. Sanctify them with what? Truth. Thy word is truth. How about that? You're clean by the washing of the water of the word. Right. Truth is what will clean you up. Amen. Truth is the thing that contrasts the word that you're living in. It is light to darkness. Amen. 
So you need to grab a hold of that. Now here's you live in this day and time. You live in a day and time where the Bible says men love darkness rather than light. Why? So you know what happens? People would rather sit at home at nighttime and watch the blue go than they would to come to church. You say, why? They love darkness. Why? Their conscience being evil. Their conscience being seared. The Lord turning them over to the reprobate mind to do those things that are unseemly. Turned them over. It was already there. He just let them have it. He didn't make them have a reprobate mind. Make sure you get that right. God didn't give them the mind that made them become homosexual. The Lord just turned them over to where they were already at. You say, well, what can they do? Well, if they'll let the truth in, the Lord can help anybody. There's no unpardonable sin in the Bible for you in this age with the exception of rejecting Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't get a do-over. That boy that just had his skull cracked or his neck stretched or somebody snapped it or he hung himself or whatever, he knows the truth now. You say, well, you think he'll get another chance? Well, sure. Wouldn't it be a blessing? He'll show up at the great white throne judgment and he'll stand up there at the judgment seat, I mean, at the great white throne judgment and he'll be able to match his righteousness with God's righteousness, which would be Jesus Christ. And if he can measure up to Jesus Christ, he gets to get in. You know what I know? I know I've met some old people sometimes. and I mean no disrespect when I'm referring to their age. I've met some old people sometimes. You know what they think? They think they stand a chance like that. Yet the Bible says all our righteousness is as filthy rags. So what do I have to do? That, that, that Bible don't, it don't pull any punches. That's why they want to change it. That's why they don't want you to read it. I'm going to mention this in the upcoming service, but what you may not realize, and I'm going to say this without the kids being present, but the devil is done with your generation as much as you may not think so. He ain't after you. He's after your kids and your grandkids. You say, how? Get them doing something on Sunday other than come to church. You say, why? He doesn't want your kids here. He's not worried about this church. He's got enough sense to pay attention to the long game. So you know what you have now? You have people that are doing everything on Sunday and church is not even in their thought process. They don't even think about it anymore. And so nowadays you have football, basketball, baseball, beach, lake, soccer. Uh, you have golf. You have tennis. You have all kind of games and, and this and that and the other. You have school. You have work. You have everything you can possibly imagine to interest the kids to take the emphasis off coming. Listen, when I was grown, I was in church nine months before I was born. You got to think about that for a minute. And then when I was hatched out, I never missed a service. I'm not saying, I don't get credit for that. I didn't get a choice. Right. When I was at home, you, you folks, you, you, you amaze me. Do you want to go to church? My foot. My dad never asked me if I wanted to go. He never even, he never, he didn't care. He didn't value my opinion at all. <laughs> and what was worse is, is every Saturday night, we had to polish our shoes. This is old, not this stuff out of a bottle. You had to go get the wax and get the rag and wipe the rag and then you had to, put it on the shoes and you had to do this and then you had to brush it and then pop it and then brush it and pop it and you set your shoes out and you set the clothes out you were wearing the next day. It wasn't going to be none of this looking through the closet. I can't find nothing to wear. And uh, No, no, uh-uh. And you had your bath on Saturday night and then you went in there. Now, I see, I was raised in the day. If you had like a cow lick sticking up, Mama didn't take you to the bathroom. She just... <laughs> And if you'd got a, if you were stupid enough to have rubbed up against something on the way in and you had a mark on your face, they called them a spit bath. You, you, why? You're going to church, you ain't going to look like, you look like cotton picking Dennis the Menace, man. You, come here. You know, hold that thing down and sticking up, you know, like a, a cowlick sticking up like that. I, I never was given a choice. Shoot, man, I wasn't given a choice. I went back over to visit my parents after I'd already moved out of the house and I was already working a job and going to school and doing all that other kind of stuff. And I come by and my dad comes by the door to my old room over there, walks in the door. I don't mean to be ignoring you folks over here. Comes, walks by the door and, and he says... To me, um, okay, we'll be leaving for church at whatever the time was. And I'm thinking, I'm a grown man. <laughs> but he said it with a tone that I realized <laughs> I didn't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> you came back over, glad to have you visit. We'd be ready for church at such and such a time. You know what? They want your kids. You know the worst form of child abuse today? 
you say, well, pedophilia and all that kind of stuff, that's a tragedy. But you know, there's an even greater tragedy that parents and grandparents don't care about the souls of their kids anymore because you're so bitter at church and bitter at people in the church and bitter at people in the parking place and bitter in people. The preacher said this and the preacher did that and the preacher so and so and them and they did this in Sunday school and they didn't recognize this and all that other. And your kids are like, yeah, and when I turn 18, I'm going to go buck stinking wild. And you wonder where they're at. The devil got them. You say, why? Because you don't care. I didn't give, you, give them a choice. Give them a choice. Do you give them a choice when it comes to school? Why are you afraid it hurts your reputation? They grow up being stupid. Is that why you make them go to school? Or are you afraid they'll put you in jail? Or are you really doing it for their benefit? Pardon me, I didn't mean this. I know it's just Sunday school. We're just trying to, I'm just trying to kind of warm things up. Now, Brother Boone, I told you it's a soft, gentle day today. It's going to be a sweet. He said, Preacher, I, I've been watching you for a long time and stuff like that. And he said, I, am I sitting too close to the front? I said, no. I said, I can hit you from there. You'll be all right. <laughs> I'm getting old, but I still got pretty good aim, you know. <laughs> but if it comes in your direction, if you see Brother Dan kind of slide to his right, you'll know, oh, man. <laughs> Brother Donnie will lean back and he'll say to you, sorry, that was aiming at me, but he's getting old. He's a little shaky. <laughs> You know what amazes me is that people don't realize the most important thing in your life right now is your spiritual condition. Yes. The condition of your soul is all that matters the minute you die. You know what reminded me of that? I looked yesterday at Hokun and, and she's uh, in there uh, in, the, in the casket there and they get ready to close the thing and she's already gone on to her reward. She's already on the hillsides of glory. But buddy, don't it register in my mind. How many people that I spoke to yesterday and how many am I going to speak to today that have no thought at all right. about what's coming in eternity? No more ready than a billy goat. Not even thinking about the judgment seat of Christ. Not just, I got plenty of life to live. and You say, how do you know? Well, there's vacant chairs in Sunday school. Amen. You say, why? Coming to church for something other than I need to get things balanced back out. I got to get to this or I ain't going to ever get to it. So truth becomes your measuring stick. By the way, there is a passage in the Bible. You'll hear this this morning. I believe all the passages in the Bible are relevant. Do you? Amen. Do you believe they're absolute truth? Yes, you believe they're not requests, they're orders. Is that right? Amen. More than just the Ten Commandments. Is that right? Amen. You say, oh boy, he's setting me up. You're right, I am. <laughs> Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together even more so such as you see the day approaching. Amen. How many of you love Jesus? I'll see you tonight. <laughs> Seek ye the kingdom of God and His and all these things will be added to you. I'll tell you why you got a problem with attendance. I'll tell you why. There's something else first. <laughs> it's going to be first in one of the days for some of you old crows. One of, one of these days it'll be first. You say, why? You find yourself where we were yesterday. You're going in a box one day. Amen. They're going to put you to bed with a shovel one day. You say, that's a little harsh. Well, how do you want me to clean it up for you? That's reality. Amen. You know, here's the thing. You don't know when it's going to be. Right. You assume you've got plenty of time. Says who? Amen. Says who? Amen. You wake up in the morning. I'm, I'm going to get to this in a second. <laughs> you wake up one morning and you think, I got all day. Oh, and the Lord says, you've got no idea what's going to happen to you in the next two hours. And going, going to change your viewpoint on everything. And the next thing you know, the Lord says, morning. It's always morning up there. Morning. Didn't see this one coming. The Lord said, yeah, you was living your life as if this day was never coming. Thought you'd have plenty of time to work it all out. Well, <laughs> too bad. You're here now. Can I go back? Mm -mm. Too late. I guess you're going to wish you'd maybe put me first now. I've heard that song more than once up here. What am I trying to give you? I'm trying to give you some practical things to show you that your Bible reading feeds your soul to keep it alive, to make sure your conscience stays in check. You say, why? 
everything out in that cotton picking, dirty, filthy, God forsaken world is to dirty up your mind, dirty up your way of thinking, and try to get you to think contrary to God. And the devil's just about got that thing turned upside down where now all of a sudden there's no absolute right anymore. Well, that's why you need the book more than ever. Probably should have church seven days a week just to try to balance it out. Now, one of the reasons some of you stay in bondage is you don't believe what the Lord says to you about grant repentance. Uh, Ma'am or sir, let me encourage you this. It doesn't matter if your husband or your or your wife or your kids or your preacher or whoever else you don't particularly care for. If the Bible's right and you're wrong, the best thing you can do is say, Lord, they're right and I'm wrong. Yeah. And I want to do right. You say, why? That's a chain on you if not. Hebrews tells you this. He said, let us lay aside every weight and sin that doth so easily beset us. Some of the weight some of you carry is bitterness. Some of the weight some of you carry is bitterness. You're still bitter about stuff that happened to you 10, 15, 20 years ago. You're still bitter because you didn't have a mom or a dad like somebody else had a mom or a dad. You're still upset because somebody else got promoted over you or you didn't get recognized or you didn't get appreciated. You don't know what God protected you from by not giving you what you wanted. You, don't, you can't see that side of things. You have to be able to trust that. Some of you it's anger. Some of you it's wrath. Some of you it's bitterness. I know this in that Bible. You have a stronghold if you cannot release yourself from something that's happened in your past and the Lord's already put it under the blood. That's why I'm telling you right now, if you've been married before, there's people that are here now that don't know nothing about it, so quit talking about it. You know, well, you know, you're bitter about it. She did you wrong, you did her wrong, it didn't work out, somebody said this, I didn't get to serve there, I didn't get to do this, some jack leg told me I couldn't because of this and that and the other. Okay, it's in the past. Can we move on now? Stop using it as your shield. You say, well, you know, what will people say? They're going to always say it. it's anything, everything. You say, why? Well, what are they thinking? The same thing you are. They're thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about you as much as you think they are. Don't be so narcissistic. You can yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness even after you're saved. God gives you a conscience and he tells you things you shouldn't touch, taste, handle, smell, uh, drink, all that other kind of stuff that goes along with that. That passage right there tells you that the devil can take you captive at will if you resist truth. The devil can. That's what he says. The Bible said if God peradventure, that means if perhaps, if he will, give you repentance or grant you repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him, the devil, at his will, the devil's will. So rejecting the truth has a consequence. It's not like if I accept it, I get the benefit, but if I reject it, no, uh uh-uh, no, 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 uh uh-uh. If you reject it, there's a consequence the same way there is a benefit if you accept the truth. So you have to acknowledge the truth. You say, what? If I apply it, then I become free. How do I know? Oh, I'm just going back to truth. If you have, like Miss Pat has one of those old Bibles that has uh, the, Lord, the, 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 the words of the Lord in red, if she were to read that to you right there, you know what the Lord said in John 8, 32? The truth will make you free and you shall be free indeed. Amen. The truth about what? The hardest truth in that Bible. Mm. You say Adam and Eve being created. Psh, that's kid stuff. Yep. You say Job 41 is a picture of the devil. Okay, that's kid stuff. Well, what went on in Genesis chapter number 6? Kid stuff. What went on between 1-1 one, one and 1-2? One, that's kid stuff. Well, what's such a hard truth, preacher? The truth about you that's contrary Amen. to God? Amen. That's the hard pill to swallow. Amen. You know, what our tendency is, is when God comes and brings truth our way, you know what we do? We do just what Adam did. Hide, cover up. And then you know what we do? God comes along and all of a sudden something we should embrace, we're afraid. We don't really want to have God speak to us. And next thing you know, you know where we are? (laughs) They say it nowadays. It's a modern saying. Well, he's off in the bushes somewhere. That's right out of Genesis 4, Genesis 3. (laughs) Where's Adam and Eve? They in the bushes. Let me show you, Adam. Here, let me show you your husband, ladies. (laughs) As soon as God squares off and he realizes all bets are off, you know what he says? Well, that cotton-picking woman you sent my way. I don't think he said cotton-picking, but a a whole different translation. You know what he does? The very woman he was willing to die for, he throws her right under the bus in front of God. (laughs) I guess you did fear God, son. 
You're indirectly blaming God. You're saying, God, if you hadn't created that woman. You know what? I had a braying donkey tell me one time. You can fill in the blanks as to what I really would like to say there, but in the interest of trying to be sophisticated, I'll just call him a braying donkey. You know what he said to me one time? He said, I'm not accountable for my sin. I said, oh, okay. I said, and why is that? He said, because God created the devil, and if he hadn't created the devil, I would have never sinned. I just looked at him. I said, you know something? <laughs> You're a fool. Mm -hmm. He said, why you say that? I said, you have enough sense to believe in God and the devil. And now you're blaming God for your sin instead of saying I'm a sinner because I guarantee you if that's true, you sinned because you wanted to. The right. devil didn't make right. you do it. Right. Your name ain't Flip Wilson. Right. For you younger ones, that's a <laughs> comedian that used to always say when he messed up, the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't have the power to make you do it. But he can sure give you the choice. If he could make it, why didn't he hold Eve down by the throat and get her behind the jaws like you get a, a mare and you can't get that bit in her mouth? Why didn't he grab her behind the jaws and hit that pressure point and make that mouth fall open and shove those grapes down in there? Because it wouldn't have mattered as against her will. She willingly chose. You know what I know about me and you? I don't know if that's proper or not. No, that's correct. Amen. You know what I know about me? You know what I know about you? Is the fact that when we sin, we do so willfully. Amen. He doesn't force us into right. it. Right. We know exactly what we're doing. If the Bible's right, the Holy Spirit told you before you did it, you Amen. just decided, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> did you pray about it? You don't have to pray about all that. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. What time is it? Oh, Lord, I'm not moving on fast enough. <laughs> Where right and wrong is generated, David said, created me a clean heart, renewing me a right spirit. And so this is the, where the right spirit is generated. Now I gave you this thing, has to do with your thought process. Your thought process better be in line with God's thought process. Or are you going to be a soup sandwich? You say, why? By the way, that, that thought process changes based on sometimes just where you're born and culture. Sure it is. I've been to other countries. I've had the privilege of traveling. There's things that you automatically take for granted. Those people don't even know anything about. It's not that they're ignorant. They were never taught some of the things you grow up. Some of you grow up, you know what you've been taught? You've been taught you're a victim. And it's, and it's because of where you were born or the color of your skin or because you were on the wrong side of the track. Some of you on the flip side of that think you're better than other people because of where you were born and the color of skin and that you were born on the right side of the track. Somebody had to teach you that. That's not natural for you to think that. Somebody taught you that prejudice. Somebody taught you that preference. Why are you getting nervous? It's kind of like reach underneath your seat. You'll find a pew hymnal there, and you'll also find a barf bag we borrowed from the airlines. You can go ahead and throw up now. You say, why? Somebody educated you that way. They taught you something contrary to the Bible. Oh, you sure are mighty proud to think you're better than anybody else. Mighty proud, boy, mighty proud. Boy, I'm, I'm God's gift to everything. Boy, I'd be careful there. Now, this has to do with your thought process. You say, why? Thinking matters. Oh, preacher, what do you mean thinking matters? Well, let's just go to the Bible. Isn't that where we started? Wasn't it about foundational truth, right? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Uh, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The Lord says, for out of the heart come murderers and uh, adulteries and fornications. And there's a list of about five things there that won't come to me. Why? Because it's what's in the heart that destroys the man. It's how you think. If thinking doesn't matter, then just be as minded, uh, blank-minded as possible. If what I'm telling you is not true, how come it is that when people get drunk, the first thing that goes is their ability to make right and wrong decisions? I had an individual who came here for quite some time and uh, he got pretty upset. I did a little series. It wasn't long. It just lasted two or three weeks on what the Bible says. I gave about maybe 60, 70 verses on drinking. And he came up and was going to square off in a nice way about it, but he was pretty, pretty vehement. And he said, well, you know, we don't see a problem with it and we serve it at our table and we do this. And we, I said, okay, well, that's fine. Well, you're teaching contrary to what I teach in my family. I said, okay, well, 
go help help yourself. I mean, that's your business. It's your home. I'm not coming in there and take a wine bottle and bust it over the thing and pour it all out and all that. And I said, but I'd, I just have one question for you. He said, well, we, can't, we couldn't be a part of something like this because I think you're not scriptural. I just don't believe. I believe Jesus drank wine. I said, well, you might be on some thin ground there. I said, you might want to do a study on grape juice and all, which I did in all that. I had strong drink and how it was used for, anest uh, for anesthesia and how it was used for pain and, and, and all those other kind of things and different things. Did a, did a full-blown, uh, I, I felt like a, a relatively decent dissertation on the whole thing. And I said, so you don't believe it makes any difference? He said, it doesn't make any difference at all. I said, you have a daughter? I knew he did. It was rhetorical. He said, yeah, I have a daughter. You know I have a daughter. I said, well, if there's nothing wrong with it, I said, why don't you encourage her and her date to go out and have just, uh, you know, a few pops of wine on their next dinner meeting on their next date. Yep. He said, why would you say that? I said, well, why would there be a problem? Amen. See? See how I just caught some of you right there? You're thinking... I didn't think about that. Well, go ahead and let your girlfriend, your, your granddaughters, your great-granddaughters, go, go ahead, you little wine popper every now and then. Just every now, you know, just special days like my back hurts and my corns are aching. And it's, uh, it's, it's uh, St. Patrick's Day, Groundhog Day, Christmas, Easter, my day, my way, any excuse will do. <laughs> had a rough day, it's happy hour, you know, I, <laughs> whatever. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. You good, godly, dedicated, spiritual person, you, if it's all right, why not let the kids have it? What's the problem with you can't have it until you're 21? What's the problem? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I, 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 it just came to me. You can handle it. It doesn't defile your conscience and sedate your ability to make good, clear decisions. If it's okay, I said to him, you have a job, right? You know I have a job. I said, hey, pop the top at lunchtime and see if your boss is okay with that. Come back from lunch with liquor on your breath. If it's okay. He said, well, it, would, it, it, it wouldn't be okay in the business. I said, well, why not? If it doesn't do something to you yes. other than just I'm enjoying it for digestive purposes. <laughs> I said, with all due respect, sir, you're thinking yourself a little more sophisticated than you truly are because by having whatever that is there, making yourself a connoisseur of fine wines and that kind of a thing, I said... That Bible says when a man thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Amen. And I said, your own testimony is condemning you right now because you know I'm telling you the truth. And I said, how about letting your son have it and then don't get mad at the police when they arrest him for blowing over 08 and he winds up in for DUI if it doesn't matter. And don't tell me it doesn't hurt your testimony. I said, how would you be if I chug a lug down here in front of... He's, well, you're a preacher. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, and so are you. Mm -hmm. And you're preaching to me yeah. right now. Right. And such were some of you. Yep. Right. Yep. Worldly stuff, worldly influence. I don't have to tell you all the stories of how all the drunks and how many people they killed and what all they did and how still the number one problem with violence in the home is the presence of alcoholic beverages. Amen. You say, why? Because you lose that ability when the Lord says to you or your conscience says, don't slap her. Yeah. Or don't smack him or hit him with a flower vase. You've had just enough that cut cow. And now she's over there with her nose splattered and blood all over the place and on the phone and the police look at her and say, well, I don't think she did that to herself. And then you're taking the joy ride of your life. I don't know what happened, man. I don't, I don't know what, i tell you what happened. <laughs> you, your conscience got dead. And that, that, that brake that he put on you to help you, it, it wasn't no brakes on that car. 
man, you stuck it on the floor, boy, and she stayed stuck. And the next thing you know, she said just whatever, and boom, now you've done irreparable damage. It's hard to put it back together after yes. that. Yeah, yeah. You start putting your paws on each other, that's hard to overcome. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm, Amen. I'm, I mean, I'm Amen. flinging it down this morning, as Mama Utley would say. <laughs> Y'all just don't look like you're hungry. <laughs> Maybe I'm putting the wrong food in the trough. Well, if you'll come and be with us in the morning service, Amen. we'll get off of this and get on something else. <laughs> Father, bless your word this morning and Help us, Lord, in these matters, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.